happy to see you all here. We are just waiting a little bit for folks to join. As always, if you have a good joke, preferably hydrogen related, you can tell it. Aaron, Bill here. Hi, Bill. Did you, you have a joke to share with us? What's have that? You been, have you been paying attention to the AMR attending? We are going to talk about that today. Okay. Um, I missed you. the introductory presentations yesterday and uh, have not caught much of today's, but um, I think this will be a great chance to share any takeaways from anyone who's been able to catch it. Have you been able to catch it? Part of it, yes. I listened part, part yesterday and part today. Good, good. And I'll, and I'll, break, I'll break from you at 12.15 for uh, Chris San Marquis' talk on uh, pipeline materials. Okay, great, great. Well, why don't we go ahead and get started since we're two minutes past the bottom of the hour and I would like to stay more or less on track since I know people have busy schedules. Welcome everyone to our monthly hydrogen working group meeting. Um, I am talking to you from Fairbanks today, actually. I am in Fairbanks this week and next, um, the official home of the Arctic Energy Office and uh, where my kids are in uh, summer music and fine arts camps for two weeks, um, not coincidentally. So anyhow, it's beautiful here in Fairbanks in the mid seventies, sunny, um, it's like real summer. So very exciting. Um, let's see here. We always start with any new attendees who are brave and bold enough to introduce themselves. Um, if you've never been to one of our meetings, um, we'd love to hear from you who you are, um, your affiliation, and why, why you're joining us today. It's a fr friendly group, so I encourage folks to, um, to speak up if you're new to the crew. I see Evan Gray. Hello, Evan. We know you, or I know you, but please go ahead and, and introduce yourself. Uh Good morning, I think. Uh, it's um, mid 70s, well, it will be mid 70s here in eastern, northeastern Australia as well, but we call that winter. Um, so uh, I'm Evan Grafe, uh, Professor of Physics at Griffith University in Brisbane, Australia, and I've been invited to make a presentation to you this morning on um, the hydrogen related activities of the Blue Economy Cooperative Research Centre. Um, I'm a solid state physicist, but uh, work in a, a wide span of activities, um, all the way from techno-economic assessment and and uh, optimization of energy systems and enterprises, through to density functional theory applied to hydrogen and materials, and building microgrids and doing a lot of hydrogen storage materials work in between. Wonderful, Evan. We are really looking forward to your presentation. Um, just for my edification, what time is it in Australia there? It's 5.36 a.m. 5.36 a.m.? Yep. Oh, uh, but, it's, but, it's, but it's the seventh. <laughs> there's, there's, that thing, there's that thing called the international date line between us. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Wow. Well, thank you for getting up so early. You are a trooper. We are so appreciative. Uh, you're welcome. It's actually only half an hour early for me. Okay. Okay. I'm um, looking forward to, to hearing everybody. Good. Good. Any other new attendees or anyone who would like to introduce themselves? It doesn't even have to be 5.30 a.m. your time for us to, to be impressed. We're happy to have you here. Or even if you've been here and you haven't introduced yourself before. Anyone? Uh, I, I guess I can give a, a quick intro as a, as a first timer here. Um, hello everyone, I'm, my, my name is Paul McKinley. Um, I'm currently a student uh, working on uh, hydrogen uh, electrolysis projects. Uh, I'm currently in the engineering department at the University of Cambridge, but um, my background is in physics. I, I studied in the US at Pomona College. Um, and I, uh, a few summers ago, did some uh, Arctic uh, Alaska atmospheric science work. And so that's been kind of the interest in the Arctic and, and Alaska. And I'm now sort of more on the energy side. So interested to uh, hear the presentations today. 
Wonderful, Paul. Thanks for joining us. I'm glad to have you here. JR, did you raise your hand or were you just waving? I was just waving at Paul. <laughs> okay. See how friendly this crew is? PJ. Hey, uh, good, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is PJ Callahan. I'm with the Center for Transportation and the Environment, uh, CTE. We're a nonprofit group uh, with a mission in, in sustainable transportation. Uh, technologies. Uh, we've done a little bit of work with Launch Alaska. I see Tim Leach is on the call here, and that's how I actually got connected with this group. But uh, I was actually born in Anchorage uh, uh, back in the 90s, and have since uh, kind of moved around a little bit, been in Michigan, and now I'm in our in our California office. But do a lot of work with uh, hydrogen and, and commercial uh, commercializing new technologies and transportation. I'm actually currently at a training facility. We're helping to launch um, 10 Hyundai fuel cell electric trucks, and this week we're doing training with the technicians and the operators. So uh, I'm gonna be a little bit in and out on video here, but I wanted to listen in um, during the, during our other training here because I'm really excited about potential opportunities in Alaska. Thank you, PJ. And where did you say your training center is that you're located at? This is currently in uh, San Leandro, California, but our offices are in Berkeley uh, and Atlanta primarily. Very nice. Glad to have you here. Thank you. And I yes, see Brandon has, has a hand up. Brandon. Yes, thank you. Sorry, I don't have video. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. I've been on the last few months. I haven't introduced myself. I'm I, working with the U.S. Army um, here in Hawaii for the Pacific headquarters. Um, and under that umbrella is our two bases in Alaska, Fort Greeley and Fort Wainwright um, near Fairbanks. Uh, recently, I helped uh, Fort Wainwright apply for a grant opportunity uh, affect grant opportunity to pursue a hydrogen fuel cell project at their base <clears throat> um, so just kind of listening in on the trends um, trying to get some insights hopefully that project gets selected and I'll have more to share. Wonderful Brandon I'm so glad you finally got the courage to introduce yourself. Um, and Brandon, Paul, PJ, Evan, it would be great if you could put your contact info into the chat for anyone to follow up with you afterwards, um, if you feel up for that. Um, sure. Are there any other new attendees or introductions of old attendees um, before we get started here? Okay, and again, if you're new, please consider putting your name and uh, contact info, email would be fine into the chat function. Um, just so one, Patty can make sure you're on distribution lists and two, uh, we can all communicate with, with you and follow up. Okay, great. Well, let's jump in here. Um, we've got a lot of things that have happened in uh, the last couple of weeks. Uh, two weeks ago, we had the Alaska Sustainable Energy Conference and we had our social hour there with uh, Marvin's um, hydrogen engine. And it was just a great chance to see a number of you in person in Anchorage. Uh, I really enjoyed the chance to, to see everyone in the flesh. And of course, everyone was a totally different height than I imagined they would be as I imagine I might have been for folks as well. So it's always, um, it's wonderful and also sometimes surprising to, to meet people in person after you had these video uh, conference calls. Um, that was mostly a social gathering. I know that Marvin's engine got a lot of questions. I hope people were able to connect uh, with him uh, for follow-up conversations. Uh, and most of all, it was just um, lovely to have that, that kind of group fellowship together. Um, that was on the eve of the Sustainable Energy Conference, which was another exciting week. Uh, thanks to the governor and John Espindola, who I see on this call and others um, in the governor's office and in many other organizations who helped to make that possible. Um, I was fairly tied up um, chaperoning the Deputy Secretary of Energy for most of the week, and we did a visit out to rural Alaska. I would love to hear from folks um, if there were any intriguing hydrogen discussions during the conference um, that you'd like to report out on to the group. 
um, whether there were developments or, or questions raised or concerns, um, anything of note to share from specifically the Sustainable Energy Conference. Go ahead, JR. So one thing that was mentioned almost in passing, and I, I maybe there are people in this, uh, this call that know more about it that I found really fascinating given um, some of the discussion that's occurred in the past about the energy transition and the um, how nice it would be if we could use existing uh, natural gas infrastructure in order to distribute hydrogen. Uh, I'd certainly come, had the developed the impression that this was something that was still very much cutting edge, and there were questions about how FEMSA would be uh, how they would regulate um, hydrogen blending, about you know how that would be done in a in a safe manner, about how it would affect uh, different um, uh, you know components within the natural gas system, and so that there was a lot of work to be done. There was a comment in one of the presentations that uh, Hawaii gas has been blending hydrogen in with natural gas for like a century now. And I was like, would we just, I want to hear about that for like the next hour. <laughs> um, so I, I was, I was fascinated by, by that. I mean, if, if that's true, that means that you know, FEMS has already figured this out. There's at least one utility in the world. I mean, I know it doesn't get that cold in Hawaii, but they have to have some pipes with natural gas in them. So um, I was I was really interested uh, in, in that particular piece. Hey, Art, this is Bill. Go ahead, I Bill. To, I talked to the gentleman who represented uh, Hawaii in that panel and concluded with him that they are able to succeed by maintaining a constant pressure fairly low pressure, and these are old pipes which are low alloy steel. They do not represent an attempt to use existing natural gas transmission pipelines repurposed for either blended or high uh, purity gaseous hydrogen in the lower 48 or even in Alaska for that matter. It's a rather special case with a very small uh, distribution area. So we need to be careful of that. Thank you. Any other input on the on the Hawaii use case? Uh, maybe I could add something. Um, embrittlement being one of the many areas that my group works on. Uh, sorry, it's Evan Gray. Um, the uh, what I heard is make, makes a great deal of sense. Um, high alloy steels are the ones that are in, that are in peril, um, more in, more in peril um, from embrittlement. Um, the pressure cycling is a problem. Um, low temperatures are a problem as well. Um, and uh, at least here in Australia and in a lot of other places, companies are looking at putting maybe 10%, maybe even 20% of hydrogen blended with, with, um, uh, with essentially methane. But it depends very much on the, um, the particular alloy you're talking about. I heard someone say before they were go, going to break out to break off to attend a, a, um, a talk by Chris Sanmarki. Exactly so. Those guys at Sandia are experts on this, um, and it's a it's a kind of minefield depending on what's in the ground at the minute. Okay, Evan, just to to expand on that, Sanmarki contributed a significant section to a paper I presented at the World Gas Conference in May of last year, in which one of his figures shows that even a 1% concentration of hydrogen in natural gas pipeline gas reduces the fracture toughness of mm -hmm. the steel by two thirds. So you're right, there is a hydrogen embrittlement problem. We must be very careful of that. Thank you. Okay, I saw Garrison's hand up next. Hi, uh, uh, sorry, I haven't been to a few meetings here. I've been been a little bit busy, um, uh, and I haven't had a full chance had a chance to read the full the full uh, roadmap plan. Has everybody has everybody read that that roadmap plan this this morning? Uh, and I'm a little late here, so I don't know if you guys talked about that. But uh, anyhow, my my perspective is uh, 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 the whole point of hydrogen is to avoid having to build pipelines. The Barmar pipeline was going to be ten thousand times, I think, was the figure more expensive per meter or no, ten ten thousand euros per meter more expensive than the equivalent HBDC um, transmission line getting uh, power from Spain to Germany. 
So, um, uh, uh, yeah, the whole point is to be able to have a bunch of renewables here, you know, transmit the, the energy over to a manufacturing hub, uh, electrolyze it where you need it, you know, electrolyze it at fueling stations, um, probably as ammonia, you know, if we're if we're uh, following the South Korea uh, Korean stake there. So, yeah, um, the whole point of hydrogen is to avoid building pipelines. It's certainly one, one approach for sure. Um, uh, but I would I would offer that Alaska presents some interesting um, challenges. So it's good to have this conversation. AJ, just to just to just to round that out, since since, you know, it's all about natural gas. You know, I think that uh, I did the math. We have 2,000 times more wind power available and in, in, in just onshore. It's not even counting the, the, the offshore wind power, more uh, uh, wind power available than the, the, the two natural gas pipeline, proposed natural gas pipelines we carry, so. Right, right, okay. AJ. Thank you. As as a native Hawaiian who grew up in Hawaii, you know, we've been, we've been putting blends up to 15% of hydrogen into the gas mix since the 70s. So this isn't something that's new to us. Um, more recently, we were able to work on the project at the Honolulu Uli Uli wastewater facility where they're blending RNG and hydrogen. So uh, we are currently working with a couple of the engineers there to do a hydrogen gas pipeline in California City. Here, here in California is the largest city and it's the third largest city in California based on geographical size, but they're not able to get the power that they need from the utility. So we are building a full microgrid. And one of the things we're doing is creating a uh, hydrogen pipeline because they do not have natural gas pipelines throughout the city. So Hawaii is definitely supporting us in trying to create more avenues to bring this to life, so to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I guess just to flesh it out a little bit, I mean, I, 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 I do understand that the Hawaii case is a little specialized, but it, it did appear fascinating that there was a utility out there with real world expertise at working with this. Um, I mean, I want to, you know, I think the benefit of understanding if and how and under what cases existing infrastructure can be used from to transmit hydrogen is useful because it's much even if you know if, if garrison were correct that you wouldn't build a hydrogen pipeline in all cases if you had the choice of building a high in a whole high voltage dc line or a pipeline if there's already a pipeline in the ground and you can use it that allows for deployment a lot faster and there are some cases where you you do want the molecule you don't necessarily use it just for power like if you're making ammonia or something Right, but uh, you know, in that case, you'd still transport it by by ammonia, which doesn't really present an environmental problem anyway. So, the 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 use case of of transporting uh, molecular hydrogen is, I think, is gonna is a pretty narrow use case. Okay, I'm gonna keep this moving because we've got a lot to cover. Um, any other takeaways from the Sustainable Energy Conference or or topics that came up for discussion there related to hydrogen? Uh, that anyone wants to share. And then we're going to move on to the merit review as well as the recently released um, national roadmap. But anything else from ASEC? Okay. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity to uh, bring your attention to the uh, annual merit review for hydrogen technologies. Uh, that uh, the Department of Energy is putting on this week. Uh, so yesterday was a bunch of plenary um, presentations and introductions, program reviews, and then today they started in with the actual projects. Um, I haven't been able to catch any yet. Um, I would love to hear from folks. And Patty, I wonder if you might actually put the link to that that Jeff showed, shared with us this morning into the chat yes. for anyone who doesn't have access to it. Um, great intro to all things hydrogen that are happening uh, in the country. Has anyone been able to catch those presentations so far? Um, and are there any reports out on any of those? 
Bill here. You need to register in order to participate remotely. But it's and free. Need, yes, it's free. And then you need to have the schedule so you'll know which of the three tracks you want to attend and then which of the uh, summary uh, presentations. There's also a poster event tonight. And I don't know whether that's going to be available remotely or not. Thank you. Yeah, has anyone been able to catch any of the tracks this morning um, or anything? It would have started at 9 a.m. Alaska time. I think it started, no, no, sorry, it started at 9 a.m. Eastern time. So it would have started really early. Um, yeah, so I, I followed the infrastructure track today. Okay. Anything new or interesting there, Bill? Uh, Yes, there was a presentation. I was just trying to find it on the program to report it back to you about a novel method for storing uh, hydrogen in uh, chemical form, various chemical forms other than, than ammonia, which may turn out to be economical and practical for everything from storage on board vessels, uh, airplanes, and, and uh, marine uh, ships, especially. I'll try to find that uh, resource for you, but it was today sometime. Thank you. Okay. Did anyone else catch any of the merit review so far? Okay. Well, it is at sort of an odd time for those of us in Alaska. Again, thank you, Patty, for putting that link into the uh, chat. I encourage folks to go sign up. There's still lots more happening this week, and there's more tracks than any one person can keep track of in a day. So it's, it's. I thought it would be useful to have any initial reports from folks who managed to catch tracks. Um, and then finally, um, we did send an email out this morning or, or Patty did rather, the National Hydrogen Roadmap was officially released. Um, I'd love to hear if someone else had a different impression, but I was fairly disappointed um, that Alaska was still you know, really only mentioned in some figure captions with regard to, you know, potentially being included at a later date. So, you know, I do understand that these things, you know, people try to get these things out in short timelines and there may not have been time to fold in some of the feedback from Alaska, but um, if you were able to read the feedback that we did submit back in golly, November, December of 2022, um, I don't think much of it was folded in, but I would love to hear if someone else had a different impression of, of what was released yesterday. I there thought it was simply a milder forward. version of my reaction. Um, one at a time here, JR. I was gonna say your reaction was just a milder version of my reaction. Well, I had to put mine into writing on email, so I had to keep it even keeled. Garrison? I, I, I read, Aaron, I read your response before I read the um, the roadmap and I stopped reading the roadmap at Cole because I basically said, okay, you know, this is, there's really nothing here, you know? Um, so uh, uh, my perspective is, you know, I, I'm trying to remember which, if it's Sweden or Denmark that just uh, uh, broke ground on the new electrolysis to methanol um, for marine shipping uh, factory. Um, France just debuted their first offshore direct wind to hydrogen uh, demonstration project, if I remember right. Um, I mean, if we were talking about two terawatts of um, onshore and offshore wind to um, methanol and ammonia liquid, liquid fuels, I think that uh, 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 maybe they would have mentioned Alaska, but we weren't even on the map. Alaska and Hawaii weren't even on the, the 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 map of the of the of the front page, and I think that that says to me we're I mean uh, the governor has been all over the place. He doesn't know um, he 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 doesn't know what he wants. To, he doesn't understand the Japan deal. Um, everybody's thinking about natural gas when wind power is ten times cheaper than natural gas, and these morons at AGDC can't seem to get it through their. I'm sorry, I, I don't I don't mean to. To, okay, to, let's, to let's keep it all. Point. Let's keep it all positive. You know, we're we're in all of the above here. Um, but I I I hear your frustration, Garrison. And, and um, as as now a DOE employee, I'm a little I'm a little embarrassed. Um, suffice it to say, um, 
I, I have some follow-up conversations to have internally in, in the department. Um, so uh, rest assured, I, I, hear, I hear the concerns. Um, did anyone think that there was anything new folded into the roadmap that I might have missed actually? Silence, deafening silence. Okay. I mean, yeah, there, there's, you know, been some other interactions, you know, with DOE that we've had, you know, that just really does sort of make it sound like they are not, what's the polite way to put this? I mean, putting Alaska and Hawaii not even on the map is probably an excellent summary of the attitude. You know, the I, I, I don't know how uh, we, we convince them that we're not just a part of the United States, but an interesting part with a lot of potential. But uh, uh, I think we're probably all eager to know how we can support you in your interdepartmental endeavors. Herein lies the challenge of my, my position. So thank you, JR. All right, well, let's keep moving forward. Um, I want to just have a, a, a brief couple moments for uh, some updates from some of our different threads. Um, I assume there's no real updates on Alaska Iceland activities, but I just want to create a space here unless someone has something to add on that thread. I feel like that's died a little bit lately, but is there something that I'm perhaps missing there? Okay. Um, with regard to the state roadmap, I know a lot of people have been wondering about this. I would like to assure you that I am working very hard right now to produce a draft um, as a result of the brainstorming sessions we had earlier this spring, and as well as some additional analysis that I have, Levi Kilter and Masha Koleva um, and uh, Vince from Sandia working on um, in terms of our current energy use. And um, I do hope to have that out for um, comment and edits and uh, rewriting, all of that uh, within the month. It's just, uh, it's been a bigger project than I anticipated and we wanna make sure we have something good for folks to comment on. So rest assured that's coming, um, not as quickly as I'd originally hoped, but we are moving forward on that. So I will keep you posted. Um, Tim, I assume there's no new news about um, the Arctic Road Rally. I know it's been postponed and you guys are looking at doing new things. Um, is there anything more you want to share there? I know I ask you every meeting and you probably I probably should just check in with you beforehand. No, no uh, additional news to update since the last time. Thank you. Okay. Um, JR, any additional news on methanol engines? Anything there? I know you and I were going back and forth with EPA and, and haven't really gotten very far. No, I mean, we, we continue to kind of pick at that, but, um, you know, globally, there is just been, even in the last, you know, month or two, just the, a, a steady drumbeat of headlines about marine engines, you know, with new manufacturers coming out with various types of marine engines. Uh, green methanol production in order to supply the marine ships that want to burn green methanol, particularly, you know, out of Europe, um, is driving a lot of green methanol production. And green methanol, of course, has to be produced entirely from, uh, you know, green uh, power or green hydrogen. Um, so, I mean, I think it's driving a lot of interesting stuff in the, the space. Um, but how we get the certification for onshore engines, uh, you know, remains a, a project. Okay. But, uh, the, the, the latest information shows that the, the, the treasury is looking at an hourly match. So, so, so if you have a mix of uh, renewables and non-renewables on your grid, uh, if renewables are, are, are at a high for, uh, uh, for 15 minutes during an, hour, during an hour, you can grab energy for that whole hour and call, call your hydrogen green. So, um, you know, the, 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 the idea that, that you can only make green methanol from 100% renewable energy is actually false. Okay. Um, I don't know as much about that. If you had some more information you could share about that, Garrison, that would be super it's, interesting. Is there something you could put in the chat there? It's, 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 it's all part of what's happening in Texas. They just had a big, uh, a, a big ado about that. And, and um, it's, uh, 
It's, is it Next Era Energy, I think, is the number one sort of uh, commenter on the hydrogen regulations. And, and, and so they've been posting about that. Okay. So it's we're just still, all we're still dealing well with the methanol engine um, hold but, up. Yeah, though, we so. Well, we bur we burn methanol in um, racing gas, uh, so it's it's not on the road, right? So it's not it's not regulated by DOT. But as far as I know, you can run up to thirty percent methanol without without any changes to certifications or, or or anything like that. Jr., did you want to respond? Um, I mean, it's it's it is a regulatory problem uh, ultimately um, in terms of being able to say label something as road gasoline it, it, in Alaska you can't go really above like 10 percent uh, once you get you know off road you can do a lot more well uh, well I've, I've, I've worked with the Department of Standards and Measures here in the state and they have a pretty wise fair attitude about testing um, they, pr they pretty much accept you know whatever 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 you say they, they, they will do you know a sample you know once a year or something like that but um, uh, we we in my chemistry class, you know, we we checked their work. We we ran uh, uh, gas uh, gas chromatography on all the local gas, and we found, of course, it's totally totally out of spec. You know, it's uh, it's nowhere near where they say it is. But uh, um, yeah, the, the the regulatory issue should not be a problem here in the, here in the state. What what I've run into in the pro in the past is um, fleets don't like to adopt um, uh, alternate fuels uh, because it voids their vehicle warranty, their, their fleet vehicle warranty. So uh, when I was uh, with the uh, Fairbanks Biodiesel Cooperative, we uh, were trying to sell fuel to the UAF fleet and they had a limit of 7% that uh, Ford would allow them to uh, run biodiesel before their uh, uh, warranty was affected. Okay, well, it sounds like there's potentially some more discussion for you two to have there. Um, Know, incongruencies between regulations and what's actually happening. Um, JR and Garrison, I'll let you two follow up um, if you wish there, but appreciate the spirited discussion. Um, okay, in that case, we are going to move ahead here to our speaker, uh, Dr. Evan Gray, um, who has gotten up very, very early for us on the other side of the planet. Um, Dr. Gray will be talking to us about hydrogen initiatives and Australia's blue economy uh, Cooperative Research uh, Blue Center. And I'm really excited to hear this perspective um, from around the globe. I know Australia is doing lots of interesting things in the energy scene. And uh, Dr. Gray, we're gonna give the floor to you. I'm hoping you have a 20 minutes or so presentation and then we can open it up for some questions and discussion. So the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Erin. I'm just uh, wrestling with sharing the appropriate screen, and I think it's this one. So hopefully everybody can see my presentation. Yes, okay. we do see it. It looks great. Right. Okay. Um, I'm I'm going to be looking at it rather rather than looking at the camera. So uh, just pay attention to the presentation. Um, so thanks very much for providing this opportunity to talk about what's happening uh, in the uh, blue economy. Cooperative Research Centre. Uh, these centres are companies that are set up between universities and industry partners. Um, this one began in 2019 with a 10 year life, uh, cash from the government, cash from the partners and so on. Um, so I'm the program leader of the Offshore Renewable Energy Systems um, program and, and uh, I'm a hydrogen animal. I have been for something getting horribly close to 40 years um, and hydrogen is really important to the, to the CRC. Uh, the next thing I have to do is to figure out how to, there we go. Uh, I mentioned before the wide span of my activities, there's a sample of stuff we do um, in my group. Um, uh, so I'm fairly thinly spread across a lot of things, but um, it spans techno-economic techno assessment to, to uh, fundamental research on materials, but there's, there's always hydrogen in there somewhere. Okay, I wanted first of all mention the thing that uh, caused this contact when Amanda Bird came to visit us uh, earlier in the year and uh, saw our hydrogen microgrid here at Griffith University. Um, this is... Uh, this is uh, the building that's supported by the microgrid. It's a solar-powered building. It's grid-connected because it needs to be uh, 
able to work at all times it, it, uh, to support the activities inside. The hydrogen microgrid was designed uh, at the same time. It wasn't an add-on later. The building was, in a sense, designed around it. And um, its purpose is to demonstrate hydrogen energy technology. It's relatively old now. It was delivered in 2013, and it took some years to make everything work properly. It was a fully commercial project, uh, but it isn't a commercial prototype. It was built with a substantial contribution of, of uh, public money, and so it's a, it's a public good project. 380 kilowatts of PV on the on the roof of the building and down the window warnings. Uh, the battery bank, which was 1.3 megawatt hours, past tense, um, suffered this event several years ago. Lithium ion batteries are rather dangerous things, and ours went up in flames. Um, we're still in train of replacing that, going through the interminable business post COVID of trying to get engineering services. We have a very conventional 160 watt kilowatt alkaline electrolyzer, 60 kilowatt PIM fuel cells, uh, both supplied by Hydrogenics, one Europe, one Canada. Uh, and in between that 115 kilograms of hydrogen storage, which is substantially bigger in electric equivalent than the battery was, and that's uh, solid state hydrogen storage. The It's, it's metal hydride hydrogen storage. Um, that's the system I won't dwell on it. It's a, uh, a mixed AC-DC microgrid, which is probably not a good idea, but it's a fairly old one. It was a, a pioneering system. Uh, the, um, the main load in the building, because it's full of people, it, it has a, 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 a floating population that's bigger than that of quite a lot of towns in the interior of, um, of my state, Queensland, and all, in fact, all across the north of Australia. So um, it has a, a population of several hundred people, depending on the time of day. So the main load's air conditioning. So the chiller there is a, is a major, uh, it is the major load. And um, the system was designed, and I don't think this was a good idea, but it was, um, it was the way it turned out, to make chilled water at night, store that in a big uh, tower. And um, so all the energy, the PV energy really needed to be shifted to night, which is where the big battery came from. But uh, these days, happily, we're starting to be able to run the chiller during the day when the aircon's actually needed. Aircon's needed for uh, probably six months of the year and not much heating in winter. That's the hydrogen storage room, the, the white Boxes you can see there each contain uh, two cylinders about the size of a laboratory. Uh, we call it a G cylinder, a, a um, 150 odd atmosphere laboratory cylinder of hydrogen. And each one of those white boxes contains 6.4 kilos of hydrogen. So that's the same as the amount of hydrogen in a Hyundai Nexo or a, a Toyota Mirai. The electric equivalent energy is 100 kilowatt hours. So it's the same electric equivalent as the the, uh, the long range 100 kilowatt hour battery in a, in a Tesla. Um, it's heavier than that battery, but it could easily be as light, each of these modules. It's twice the volume of the battery in a Tesla, but it could easily be made the same volume. Uh, and, and the differences between them come down to heat. Okay, so um, in Australia, we have resources of just about all kinds um, in various parts of the country, the wind resource, across the southern part of Australia is uh, quite amazing. Um, the readily accessible offshore wind resource, not the, not the notional resource, the readily accessible resource is at least two terawatts. Uh, and we have superb solar resources. For those who don't know, um, Australia is kind of big. Um, the area is almost exactly the same as that of the continental USA. So um, the Blue Economy CRC is particularly interested in, uh, in wave energy uh, and also in, in wind energy. Um, the tidal is good in certain places. This is tidal flow. Good in certain places, uh, but not something that we're likely to be involved with very much. We're quite focused on, uh, on because of our industrial partners, we're quite focused on wave energy and wind energy for capturing energy offshore. So research program three is um, kind of summarized here. This is a, a sort of working definition of what we do. On the left, we have to capture energy. In the middle, we have to manage it. On the right, we have to deliver it. The red stars are hydrogen. We're 
um, we're very uh, interested in generating hydrogen offshore, using it offshore. That includes uh, refueling vessels. We, we have an entire program uh, devoted to aquaculture. And we have um, the biggest aquaculture companies in, in Australia and New Zealand as partners. And so, as many people will know, there's a great need to improve the environmental footprint of that industry. And um, one of the uh, things that's going on here is that they'll be moving offshore. I think that's pretty much a worldwide trend. So provision of energy offshore to aquaculture operations is always in the back of our minds. In fact, it's in the forefront of our minds. Um, our, our research objectives and training, I just want to not go through, uh, but, but mention that they do involve uh, many more than technical objectives. We, we um, have five programs within the Cooperative Research Centre, CRC for short, which span technical aspects, of course, but they also span regulatory things, you know, safety risk, um, marine spatial planning, social licence, and so on. So all, all of those things are really important um, whenever you go to do a project involving hydrogen, because it's in most places it's new. These are some of the projects that um, have been going on in, in my research program, that it's research program three. Um, that's, that's the three uh, number ahead of all of those um, in identifiers. Uh, top row there is us finding out small projects, low budget, six month projects. Um, that's us finding out what we want to do, where we want to go in the first couple of years of life of the CRC. Bottom row is the projects that are underway. And uh, uh, don't forget, please, that the scale of what we're talking about here is uh, rather modest compared to what might happen in a country with 15 times our population. So this is a, a large cooperative research centre in a country with a population of 26 million. And, and so the kind of resources that you can contemplate in Europe uh, and the USA are, are unimaginable to us. But anyway, this is, this is where we're going at the minute. Microgrids are really important because that's how we're going to manage uh, electricity and hydrogen. Um, wave energy conversion is an important topic. Um, the modeling, of course, is very important. One has to do a lot of that before building anything. And uh, I will talk uh, very shortly about a, uh, uh, a substantial microgrid progress the project that's underway, in which we'll, we'll be uh, putting in place a 700 kilowatt electrolyzer um, in Hobart. Uh, so opportunities, aquaculture, you know, they need power, they need to displace diesel. Diesel spills at sea are terrible. They're, they're extremely damaging. Um, Oxygen is used in fish farming and uh, sustainability generally needs to be improved. Um, this is where a lot of us would probably like to be off the Great Barrier Reef or somewhere like that in Northern Australia. Um, lots of islands where energy security is a problem. They run big diesel generators. They need fresh water. Um, so desal um, and uh, again, sustainability generally is a big issue for them. This is something that's come onto our radar increasingly in the past couple of years. Um, the aquaculture industry in Australia has a very large fleet of small vessels. And we understand that, that large ships are going to be powered by green ammonia or green methanol, um, which doesn't do anything to lessen the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, but at least it doesn't increase it assuming you get your CO2 from the atmosphere. But up to about 20 megawatts, liquid hydrogen seems to be feasible. And there are already um, at the latest count in a project associated with this, about 40 vessels running on hydrogen uh, and ammonia, I think is included in that around the world at the minute and something like that number also on the drawing board. So uh, small vessels seem to be an opportunity. The one on the right was launched uh, two years ago in San Francisco. Um, that's actually an Australian company in Cat Crather, headquartered in Sydney, I think. Um, and they, they build the, the, I think they build the famous wave piercing catamarans. Uh, 
So this is a this is a topic of great interest to us as well. Uh, so to the demonstration project, these are the goals of the project, and I won't talk about them because they're just commensurate with those I showed before, and I only show them again to emphasise this point that, that projects like this do not just revolve around technical issues, they revolve around lots of other stuff as well, because they're going out there in public spaces, and especially if they're going in the water, then there's a whole raft of, of uh, possibly new regulations required to govern how this happens. This is going to happen in, and there's a list of the partners involved in that uh, on the right, most of which won't mean anything to, to the people on this, uh, this call. <clears throat> Uh, it's going to happen in two phases. The first is under is onshore and underway, and the second will be uh, offshore, which is getting kind of adventurous. There's some associated research with this, of course. The R in Research Centre uh, means we can't just do demonstration projects. This is a bench scale microgrid that's being built at Griffith University to explore QDC, which is how many people see the future of power transmission, um, and we do as well. It's already there at, at high voltage, large scale, but we want to uh, bring this down to the small scale and this is a 10 kilowatt scale uh, DC microgrid being set up with real batteries and real DC DC converters um, and um, everything else is emulated with power supplies or absolutely in software for the hydrogen parts so we don't have hydrogen stuff in a high voltage DC laboratory. Um, this is is a research project that's just getting underway in association with the electrolyzer that we're going to be installing in Hobart uh, very soon. It's supposed to arrive in August now. It's about 18 months late, like everything. Um, and uh, there's a research scaffold that will be built around that to support projects that, again, aren't just technical. They'll be things to do with origin, the, the certification of origin of hydrogen and uh, you know, supply chain safety, social license, all of those things, as well as the demonstration itself. There's another project looking at um, vessels. Uh, in the Australian and New Zealand context. On the right, there's some fairly recent data on orders uh, for PEM fuel cells, and they're up to the low megawatts now. So they may not get much larger than that, perhaps, um, but there are megawatt scale PEM fuel cells on order um, to go into uh, modest scale uh, small ships. The hydrogen microgrid um, that's being built in Hobart looks like this. The uh, it's a demonstration project, but it has a commercial imperative associated with it in that we'll be supplying the hydrogen for the Tasmanian, sorry, I'm being clumsy with my mouse. Um, we'll be supplying the hydrogen for the Tasmanian government's fuel cell buses. Um, these things are running much behind the international scene in Australia. There was a fuel cell bus project carried out more than 10 years ago, but fuel cell buses are really only getting going again uh, now, and they're still more or less at the demonstration scale. And Australia is organised into states. So all the states, this is a problem that's not unfamiliar in the USA, of course. So all the states feel they have to do their own thing. Um, and with, with the, the federal government riding shotgun or being the sheepdog barking at the sheep, they are like sheep sometimes. So every state government's doing its own project and uh, the Blue Economy CRC being headquartered in Tasmania, which is the island at the bottom of Australia that people tend to leave off the map, as happens with Hawaii, they understand. Um, that, uh, that project is... Uh, very much in alignment with what the Tasmanian government wants to do. And so we have a very good relationship with the Tasmanian government. The microgrid will be built on the BOC, um, which is part of the Linda group, along with Praxair and, and so on, um, built on their gas production site in Hobart. And so it's going into an industrial facility with all of the fun and games and the enormous spreadsheets and has op and stuff that that embodies, which is all underway to get up and going later this year. So this is a pure DC microgrid with the exception of the electrolyzer because we couldn't get a DC electrolyzer. Uh, we might take on converting the one we're about to receive later on. And uh, the microgrid 
has some PV, so there's some uncontrolled input. It has a battery. It has an emulator, so we can pretend that we've got wave or wind or something coming in. That's and uh, we have a, a load emulator, so we can pretend that we're an island or a vessel or a whatever or an aquaculture installation. Hydrogen compressor, um, just a, a buffer hydrogen storage. The storage is uh, is actually the tube trailer that's going to be sitting there being charged a couple of times a week to uh, to take hydrogen away. We have a contract to do that with the Tasmanian government. So this is a kind of a microcosm of a real system and we're going to learn a lot by doing this, we, we're sure. Phase two sees us going offshore from 2026. Um, we, this looks very much like what I just showed you, except that this we expect will be in association with an aquaculture installation. Uh, we may be able to export some hydrogen back to shore, depending on where we are. It'll be notional if, if, if it is. We do intend to be refueling some vessels and we do intend to be supplying power for desalination and lights and the general loads that are used in aquaculture and, and oxygen also to aquaculture, which is uh, quite important at some times of the year for uh, replenishing the dissolved oxygen content of the water. So uh, th the last thing I'm going to talk about, the, um, the hydrogen storage challenge is an interesting one. I should mention, by the way, here, the H2 bus means in the electrical sense, a bus, it's not a, it's not a bus with four wheels, just as we have a DC electricity bus. So hydrogen's a second energy vector here. Another energy vector that isn't shown is heat and a non-energy vector, if you like, is water. So one has to take account of all of these things when attempting to design a system like this. It's not just about the hydrogen, it's not just about the electricity, and there's always heat to manage. The, uh, I might mention, which I didn't explicitly do before, uh, that in our case where we use metal hydride storage in our microgrid in Brisbane, the fuel cell waste heat is routed um, through a thermal capacitor, that's just a big water tank, to uh, supply the enthalpy needed to desorb the hydrogen from storage. So we don't waste that heat, we use it. Okay, so here, what kind of storage can we use? We're going to need hundreds of kilograms, maybe a ton, perhaps depending on the, the kind of system we build. It's probably below the scale at which uh, liquid hydrogen would be feasible. Linda does have a project, or at least an intention, to produce liquefiers down to, I think, 250 kilograms per day is the smallest one, but they don't go anywhere near that small at the minute. So that's something to be thought about. The likely options are pressurised gas, of course, but that requires a fancy compressor. Um, and in the offshore environment, with the, the maintenance those, those require, especially at high pressure, that's something to be considered. Uh, metal hydride storage is an option because it's low pressure. It's got no moving parts apart from coolant pumps. Um, and uh, it's heavy, but you know, these are these are this is going on a barge where a few tens of tons probably won't matter at all, uh, and uh, so it's it's a it's an option that's to be evaluated. And um, so interestingly, for those who've not thought about this, uh, metal hydride hydrogen storage is commercial. Recently, ours was produced by a commercial company now quite a few years ago, Japan Steelworks, and it was bespoke, but it was commercial. Uh, GKN in Germany is now producing these large units, which are 260 kilograms of hydrogen at 40 bar. It's for those who are uh, familiar with the area, uh, it's a, a titanium, iron, manganese, probably alloy, which is, I think, the same most likely as was used in the late 19, mid, mid to late 1980s in Daimler Benz's vehicle trial in Berlin. And I suspect it's also the same alloy that's used in the two, the U212, U214 submarines, fuel cell, uh, fuel cell powered silent running submarines. Um, that are run by quite a few navies around the world. So this, this uh, modality is 260 kilos, it's 18 square meters of footprint, low pressure, it's really heavy. Here's an alternative produced by Mahitech in, in France who are now owned by uh, Hensoldt. And it's essentially the same amount of hydrogen if you build, if you acquire three of these nine tank units, they're type four tanks, 
Uh, if that's a familiar thing to you, so that means carbon fiber wound over a polymer liner. 500 bar rated, you need a substantial compressor for that. Same footprint, it's much lighter. So this is a uh, an indication of the kind of matters that you have to juggle to decide what to do here. The difference in cost might not be as much as you think. Metal hydride storage per unit energy stored over time um, can be quite competitive with batteries. And uh, that's not counting the electrolyzer and fuel cell, but in a big storage system, most of the cost is in storage. And that, by the way, is the advantage of hydrogen over batteries. You decouple the energy from the power Whereas with batteries, uh, they're proportional to each other, which is why Tesla's a big, expensive luxury vehicles with amazing performance. It's because they've got a big battery for range. Anyway, uh, lots of interesting things for us to, to um, think about um, sooner rather than later in the, lex in the next couple of years. And I think that's my last slide. So if there's time, I'm happy to attempt to answer questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gray. That is a host of projects. Um, I might just kick it off with sort of a 35,000 foot level question. Um, it looks like this is a, powered through a lot of government support. Um, and I guess I'd love to hear your comments on that. And then um, what recommendations would you have for jumpstarting a hydrogen economy um, in Alaska with lots of stranded energy sources. So I'll just, I'll just lead with those two questions. Right. Um, so yes, the, 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 the CRC program is, <clears throat> pardon me, is funded by the Australian federal government, um, but it requires pretty much matching cash um, and uh, from industry and, and a lot of in kind. I mean, the total value over the 10 years of our enterprise is something like $300 million, in, um, including cash and in kind. And so the CRC program's been quite successful. It's been going for, I think, several decades now. And there's one on bushfires, there's one on all manner of things. So they're always directed to um, problems that are important to Australian society as perceived through the eyes of government with all the people lobbying them. Um, and uh, they, they seem to, to be uh, quite successful at building bridges between universities and industry, which in Australia is a really, really hard thing to do. There is a chasm between universities that are the research providers and industry. We don't have the equivalent of the big DOE labs, for instance, in the USA, um, that are tremendous powerhouses of innovation. We have, we have one national organization, CSIRO, uh, which is large and government funded, um, but we simply do not have your uh, freedom and the mechanisms for getting funding. So getting something like this up was a really big deal. It's an extremely competitive process. Um, as to Alaska, I uh, regrettably have not been there, possibly flown over it, uh, but with all, I imagine that you've got a lot of places that are off grid and running on diesel Australia's like that across the north. People don't know this about Australia, but it's one of the most urbanized countries in the world. And so something like 70% of the people live on the, uh, are around the perimeter and almost all of those on the Eastern seaboard. So there are many communities across the north in the interior, which what we call the outback, um, where they have run on diesel generator for generations really. And so, um, that needs to, to stop. And so my perception is that you have kind of the same sort of problem, how to go about it. You, my take on these things um, goes back to JFK and, and um, going to the moon. And, you know, the guy with the power to make it happen said it has to happen. Um, and the money appeared and everything fell into place. And uh, apropos of roadmaps and and so on, if if somebody says it has to happen, it happens. And so here we're hoping that uh, well, state governments are starting to say this that 
there has to be a move away from fossil fuels to hydrogen. They're starting to do things like establish policy, provide some supporting funding to put in a hydrogen highway down the east coast of Australia, which is a long way. It spans you know, 15 degrees to 40 degrees plus uh, in latitude. And um, But I don't, I don't have a simple answer because I don't think there is one. It's really, really hard and it depends so much on the individual on the particular context of where you are. Um, in Australia, the federal government for years until the government changed um, last year was kind of aimless. And in the end, industry has been leading the charge. And so big industries in Australia, particularly the mining industry, which is the biggest, um, one, one particular very big heavyweight there who's, who's like, kind of like Musk Jr., but not crazy, um, has just put his money there and we have huge mining trucks coming into Australia and a whole hydrogen micro, uh, microcosm being developed in northwest Australia around, around hydrogen, but it's because this one guy said this has to happen. So that's my answer. Someone has to say it has to happen. Right. Right. I appreciate that. All right. I'm going to go to Garrison and then I'll um, segue to some questions in the chat. Garrison. Hey, uh, thanks so much for the uh, uh, for the presentation there. Very interesting to, to see what you guys have done with hydrogen. Um, so um, in researching the perfect fuel, uh, 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 there, there's not a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, good options for, for high volumetric and, and mass uh, energy density. Um, so does anybody have any idea what the number one most energy uh, dense fuel ever tested was, uh, uh, both volumetrically and, and uh, by mass? Actually, hyd liquid hydrogen is technically more, more by mass, but meeting both uh, density requirements, does anybody know? That would be plutonium. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, a fuel that you can burn uh, in a in an existing engine or motor. No, no ideas. Okay. So uh, uh, the answer is a, a borane fuel. Um, the U.S. military tested it out. I think in the South Pacific at uh, right around the Korean War. Um, so it's about two hundred thousand BTUs per, per per gallon, and they were able to achieve uh, some higher um, uh, energy densities, higher higher ranges on their on their jets. Um, so yeah, I just, I just wanted to say, Hey, uh, there's probably nickel in your, in your alloys. You didn't say nickel. I think you said titanium. Um, but, uh, there's, uh, a, there's I, an enormous, there are thousands of such alloys. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Every, every single one of them that I've, that I've come across so far has used nickel as the sort of the, the, the primary chelating agent or, uh, uh, no, that's, that's the AB five types tend to be based around lanthanum equal five, but the AB twos and ABs are based around titanium, zirconium, iron, manganese. Oh yeah, yeah, zirconium is a very, very interesting one. Um, but yeah, uh, have you have you tried have you have you experimented with bor uh, borohydrides at all? Boron. Um, many people have um, borohydrides um, because the the hydrides I've been talking about are so-called interstitial metal hydrides, where hydrogen molecules dissociate, and hydrogen goes in as a proton with its surrounding electrons and wanders around. These, the, what you're referring to, we, we would call complex hydrides because they're actual um, chemical compounds with fixed stoichiometry made by a reaction. And they're extremely stable and, and essentially intractable. That doesn't stop lots of people working on borohydrides for hydrogen storage because you can get something like 18 mass percent hydrogen, whereas the ones I've been talking about, about are, are less than three mass percent hydrogen. Uh, that's the material. And um, yeah, um, I, uh, we started, we moved towards doing some work on such things, but I'm a physicist and I'm dead scared of borane. I won't have it in the lab. Um, it's, it's very nasty stuff. It's nastier than ammonia. So, um, uh, but people, yes, people are certainly working on that, but no one's got anywhere near just the practical facility of an interstitial metal hydride for solid state storage. Um, the, the high density borohydrides, even magnesium hydride requires, it's still complex hydride, it requires at least 300 degrees C to desorb one atmosphere. Um, the uh, MOFs and carbons, nanostructured carbons and those things need low temperature 
they're creeping towards room temperature. Um, but the metal hydrides are just easy. It's room temperature, it's room pressure, if you want. Or if you want a thousand atmospheres for some purpose, well, you can make a compressor using it as well, which which we work on. So it's 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 easy. Um, it's heavy, yes. If if mass doesn't matter, um, it's small. And uh, if if it's stationary and mass isn't an issue, if it's using uh, relatively cheap materials that can be recycled, and it's much less of a problem here than recycling, say, lithium-ion batteries, then I think there is a niche for it. I have no idea how big the niche is, um, but but um, uh, we decided to to use metal hydride uh, storage for our demonstration because it would be low pressure, safe, compact, and adventurous. Okay, thank you. I want to move to the chat here, and Nathan, I do see your hand up as well. Um, there's some questions about um, ammonia exports. Um, I'll, I'll stop my stop sharing my screen. Okay. okay. And so I can see the chat. Okay. Yeah. So so I'm going to combine two questions here. Um, uh, yeah, there's a question about green ammonia exports to Japan. Um, as well as, uh, you know, hydrogen produced by natural gas reforming. Um, how are these export opportunities driving your program or, or hydrogen programs in Australia? Right. Within the Blue Economy CRC, we deliberately pay no attention because we're focused on other things. But um, every state government in Australia, and again, it's, it's, a, it's a federation, so this is, these are state activities, every state government in the country has dollar signs in its eyes over export because we look north and there's, there's um, Singapore to one side and then all the way around to, to uh, Japan and a career in Japan working your way around. And they're all within... Uh, reasonable uh, steaming times of almost anywhere in Australia. So um, that's a really big deal. There are proposals to export uh, hydrogen as gas um, or liquid uh, and uh, even, even in solid state. And I don't think all of those are sensible, but whatever, um, various industry players have decided that they can make um, a case for shipping hydrogen as hydrogen in those forms. And of course, ammonia is huge. Um, I think the reality is likely to be that ammonia produced on the, in the northwest of Australia will be shipped from there. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, they've got lots of sun um, everywhere. And so I suspect the ammonia industry is going to be very much based in the Northwest. Ammonia is also is already exported from Australia. So the shipping is already there. Nothing new required. You, you need to set up a big Harbour Bosch plant and, and, and have green hydrogen to supply that. So that's, I think, inevitably going to happen. Um, I mentioned CSIRO before the National Research Agency, and they're big on ammonia because they have a membrane which can be used to separate the decomposition product products. Um, it was developed for syngas, um, but um, coal gasification, Australia has nearly 5% of the world's coal. So coal's a huge industry. Um, so that was developed for coal gasification, but they've, they've been nimble and moved sideways to ammonia. So that's actually been driving some of that. Northeastern Australia has a lot of bioresources and it's possible that um, something like um, methyl cyclohexane could be shipped. A, a, a tiny notional amount has in fact been shipped, just a few kilograms to Japan, just to say we did it. Um, likewise, the Suezo frontier took 100 tonnes of liquid hydrogen from um, the bottom of the Australian continent to Japan last this year, maybe, but I forget, uh, but very recently. Um, so those those things are there. They're, they're, they're very much in their infancy, but the, the federal government in Australia uh, wants to see hydrogen as a big export industry, no doubt about it. The questions are uh, numerous, but they all sort of revolve around what form is it going to be and where. And Europe is also not out of, uh, out of the question. Everybody's yeah. nervous um, about the, the, um, uh, the 
uh, inflation reduction bill because of the enormous amount of money that's going to be poured into companies in the USA to do stuff. And so people in Australia are wondering whether there's actually going to be a market anymore or because the USA will just jump into the pond, splash all the water out of the pond and leave nothing for anybody else. But anyway, it's all going to wash out somehow. Right, right. Someone was also asking in the chat about um, the price of hydrogen produced by natural gas reforming in Australia. Do you know what that is? No. Um, okay. Natural gas itself in Australia has a weird pricing structure. Um, the, com the countries in terms of of energy vectors really divided in two. There's the West Coast, which is big on mining and has Perth, which is a city of about 2 million people and that's it, and, and some, some towns and, and cheap. gas there is cheap um, because the state government made sure that not everything would be export le exported, leaving nothing for domestic use. On the East Coast, there was no such arrangement. So natural gas prices on the East Coast are horrendous. And so hydrogen from natural gas, SMR uh, here, would be very expensive. Um, uh, there, there would only be a couple of plants, and um, I don't know what the what the price is. I do know that people tell me that um, if you can do at the minute in in Australia, if you can do hydrogen at even twelve dollars Australian a kilogram, so that's like eight dollars US a kilogram. That's actually um, price parity with diesel. Okay. Okay. Nathan, I saw that you had your hand up. I also saw that you chimed in in the chat. Do you still have a question, Nathan? I'm trying to remember exactly what my question was, but I know. Uh, so one, uh, one Sorry thing I'm going to ask answers. is, <laughs> is uh, uh, about mining. Is is has Australia been ramping up uh, mineral production, and is there any like minerals in particular that are hot on the list? Oh, Australia has almost anything you can think of. Um, we have lots of rare earths. Um, we have lots of monazite sands, you know, out of which you get thorium and stuff that gets sent and ends up in French reactors. Um, we have a substantial resource of lithium, which is now being uh, starting to be exploited at a much higher rate. Um, if Australia wanted to do magnesium-based hydrogen storage, we have huge magnesium reserves. Uh, but Australia really became uh, a rich country on the back of, of agriculture and mining um, of, of iron ore. Uh, we still export huge amounts of iron ore. We still export huge amounts of coal. Yeah. And I guess speaking of iron ore, I saw that uh, I saw an update that Twiggy is working on uh, ammonia powered trains. And I was wondering is there any other uh, Twiggy uh, projects? It was indeed he that I was referring to as you twigged. Uh, this is Andrew Forrest, um, who uh, uh, is the, the CEO and, and uh, heavyweight in uh, Fortescue uh, Metals Group and also uh, Fortescue Future Industries, which has been set up to promote hydrogen and other, other renewable technologies. So yeah, they need mining trains. They go, they're, having, they're having hydrogen power, huge hydrogen powered trucks um the the that's that's the hydrogen sort of microcosm that i referred to as being set up by by him in northwestern australia absolutely he's changing his whole operation and because he can uh, he can say this has to happen and put the money there it's happening therefore and i and guess prov and providing I'm... he's he's providing a a sort of a um, a, a light for the rest of the country to follow in many ways and behaving the way the prime minister should have been behaving. Yeah, and I guess uh, on that note is, so, you know, there's that ammonia powered train, but I guess, is there any, is ammonia still just an export uh, move for Australia or has there been interest in remote power at all, let's say in the Northwest, or is that all going to be hydrogen that, you know, mainly you're focusing on? within Australia? I, I don't think anybody, lots of people will probably say they know the answer. I certainly don't. Um, I think it's going to depend so hugely on, on local circumstances. Big mining companies could go for ammonia. They could have reasons to go for, for hydrogen. Uh, I mean, hydrogen as hydrogen. Um, I, I don't think there's a single answer anywhere. Um, there never has been in the past. 
at this sort of stage of the development of technologies, there were always been numerous around and what emerges like the marsupials, uh, sorry, like the, the mammals emerging from the leaf litter when the dinosaurs crashed is, is I suspect, unpredictable. <laughs> but um, uh, across the country, there are, there are projects on most aspects that you can imagine involving most of the forms of hydrogen um, including methanol, of course, uh, and everybody's building PV and wind farms as fast as they can. Wind farms, by the way, are now um, uh, planned and, and almost to construction at the gigawatt scale uh, around the southern coast. So there's, a, there's an awful lot of activity and it's arisen very uh, quickly as people realised that it was important to do this, but how it all pans out, I don't think anybody has a crystal ball, really. I guess that's all onshore wind. Uh, I guess offshore still uh, on the horizon, or is 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 there offshore projects as well? Oh no, these big projects are offshore. Um, they're in Bass Strait and around the around. So um, Australia is this big lumpy thing, and bottom right is Victoria. Um, Bass Strait is is, is uh, uh, latitude 40, and the roaring 40s howl across there because there's nothing between them and South Africa, uh, between that landmass and South Africa. So it's a very very good wind resource. It's also a very very good wave resource. Yep. So there are there are multi gigawatts worth of projects um, now uh, into engineering phases to go around that southeast corner of Australia, and I think likewise. There will be uh, around the southwest corner of Australia and wave projects uh, there as well. They're much, much further back in technology development, but the wind projects are substantial and they're offshore. I, of, onshore wind in Australia, if you look at the map, the offshore resource is so much better. Um, and onshore wind projects in Australia tend to have problems with social license because they tend to be built on mountain tops and, and you can see them and so on. And, you know, the big roads they have to build to take the blades up to, to, to mount the turbine and so on, they cause a lot of problems. So I, I think offshore is going to be far, far bigger. And the resource is enormous anyway, as I mentioned, the readily accessible resource. That's within, I think, 50 kilometres of a substation on land less than 100 metres water depth and so on, um, the, the resource exceeds two terawatts. And I, I guess... Australia, uh... Australia's... Uh, sorry, I interrupted you yet again. Forgive me. <laughs> Australia's national e electricity market, uh, which is on the East Coast, peaks at 30 gigawatts, below 30 gigawatts. So this is you know, 60 to 70 times the size of the national electricity market. So th th and of course, people have export in mind. Yeah, yes. So between the two countries, Alaska and Australia, I think we have two terawatts and you have two terawatts. I think that's the global electricity demand, isn't it? Two, uh, four terawatts or so? 4,000 gigawatts? 4, um, I, I, yeah, I, I, my memory says it's 2.8 or something. But that's a few years old. Yeah, yeah, so between the two of us, we could power the world. Absolutely. Well, I mean, it's well known that if you want to take an area in the middle of Australia that's under a million square kilometres um, and fill it with PV and you know, put a superconducting cable around the globe, that's everybody's, everything powered as, as electricity. Yeah. Okay. Are there other questions for Dr. Gray from anyone else on the call? I had uh, one more question. So I guess the the what I wanted to ask is um, some you know I'm familiar with a lot of you know hydrogen, liquid hydrogen, hydrogen carriers, but uh, you know more with metal hydrides. You know one thing we sort of struck or sort of deal with in Alaska is scale. So a lot of the communities are sort of small, and we know to really get economies of scale, you know sometimes it helps to have you know larger uh, you know larger electrolyzer uh, mm. for for hydrides. Uh, you know, do you see that as, you know, a possible uh, transportation? Uh, and if so, you know, what what would be kind of the transport range and, and maybe the scale of, right. a, of yeah. a hydride? Do, do you mean, Nathan, for powering vehicles or for distributing hydrogen? Yeah, so we, for uh, for distributing hydrogen, maybe between right. communities that 
you know, might not have, uh, you know, connection by uh, yep. electrical grid. So, yes. Um, so the reason, just to go back one, if I may, the reason really we chose metal hydride for our demonstration here, apart from it being my main research area, <laughs> is um, that it's low tech and it's very suitable for, I mean, across the top of Australia, we have the opposite to you guys. We in Alaska, we we have, um, you know, cyclones, um, hurricanes, um, and floods, and you know, the wet season up there is terrifying. Places are are isolated for weeks or even months sometimes at a time, and so there's a need for really, really, really reliable. Uh, energy storage and and diesel out there costs something like seven times um, what it costs to get it to these places. The the sorry the electricity produced from diesel costs something like seven times because of the the huge cost of getting diesel out there. So and there are medical centres that have to run and so on and so on. So I think there's quite a lot of opportunity for small places where you would store say less than one ton of hydrogen. You can do that in metal hydride form. It's it's four of those GKN units, for instance. That's a ton of hydrogen. To transport hydrogen as metal hydride, there are two options I I know about, and the the conventional interstitial metal hydrides are really really easy to deal with, but they're so heavy that that um, you would only really <laughs> do that for small very small scale i think where you had particular reasons to do so but you know you our 115 kilos of hydrogen storage weighs um 15 tons or something not that any attempts been made to make it light you could maybe do it you know, but but it you maybe you do it in 10 tons but it's but it's it's very heavy the but there is an option based on magnesium there are two actually one is magnesium so magnesium hydride doesn't uh, d dissociate until you reach 300 degrees C and to get one, to get 10 atmospheres, I'm trying to say atmospheres, not bar, to get 10 atmospheres, um, you need to go to 400 degrees C. Nevertheless, it's commercial. The, there is a company called C280, which does magnesium hydride in oil. And so it can be shipped in an oil tanker an absolutely normal oil tanker. And this is one of exactly what you said, Nathan, is one of the options that, that C280 proposes for their, for their product. It comes out of the USA, by the way. Um, so uh, shipping magnesium hydride uh, in oil, and then you need the high temperature to, de to desorb the magnesium hydride at the other end. You've, you've got to have solar, high temperature solar heat or high grade waste heat or something or electric heaters or whatever. Um, the other option is a company called Hydrexia, H-Y-D-R-E-X-I-A, which was originated in Australia based around that huge magnesium resource. And then they couldn't, they got up to the, you know, to pre-commercial and they couldn't get a, they didn't quite make it but they've been bought by a Chinese company and resurrected. And so they are now, um, I think they're actually building trailers, um, which will take essentially one ton of hydrogen in a, in a uh, we call it a semi-trailer. Anyway, a big truck, a big articulated truck. So that, that sounds like a modality that could be quite relevant if you need to move, say, a ton of hydrogen between, between places in Alaska and you have a road that, you, that will take a vehicle of, of um, you know, a, a, a fairly heavy vehicle, a sort of 30-ton vehicle or whatever it is. So we, we, we see so much uh, in like the comparison also. with MCO? methyl cyclohexone because i know that like i saw jr you had i mean the the small scale methanol reformers so it makes me think maybe there's small scale mco reformers on the horizon and and i guess that would be like a good i guess yeah, apples you, you to could, apples comparison maybe well um you could you could say the same i think for a few carriers the um, yeah, there, there are there are people in Japan. I remember visiting at, a, at an institution institute where they actually have a small scale Harbor Bosch plant. And I mean, when you say small scale, it was it was like a small building, <laughs> and and it seemed like an awful lot of fuss to go to when you could just do something that's relatively simple, um, like produce hydrogen. Um, you know, the the additional 
chemical technology, chemical engineering technology to produce the MCH as, as or, oh, sorry, ammonia in that case, but MCH, same thing, um, you know, seemed like, I don't know. It doesn't. It doesn't seem. My intuition, and I'm a physicist, remember, not a chemist. My intuition is that it doesn't scale down terribly well. I think those those modalities are being looked at for very large scale export for good reason. You can, of course, ship hydrogen as compressed gas. I mean, you can get um, container format Type Four cylinders. So in a, um, you know, in a, I think it's a forty foot container you can actually get a ton of hydrogen in, in at 300 atmospheres pressure. Got to go to 700, it'll be significantly smaller, a 30 foot container. Yeah, do, you, do you guys know Michael Friedrich, the UK energy policy guy? Um, he had a, 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 a CHP uh, fuel cell at home uh, he, and he just, he just got rid of it. And uh, uh, he said it was just nothing but problems. It's a nice idea. Sorry, CHP. Uh, CHP combined heat and power. Oh right. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, let's not damn an entire industry because of one experience. Um, Queensland's Energy uh, Electricity Authority had a, a fuel cell in Cairns, um, five kilowatts. You know, quite a few years ago to dip their toes in the water. They didn't know how to use it, and they killed it. Um, but you know, that's not to say there's a problem with fuel cells. There is a small system in Australia called a hydrogen battery that's now commercially produced, and it's I think about 40 kilowatt hours storage, and it's based on metal hydride. A very conventional metal hydride. It's it's a patented alloy, but they've just tweaked something so they could patent it. And it's just an electrolyzer fuel cell metal hydride storage, and it produces. Um, it's it's um, the intention is it will be economically competitive with domestic scale batteries. So the, the lots of lots of stuff happening, especially at the small scale. It's Michael Liebrich, not not Friedrich, Liebrich. Um, okay. And, and the reason he's famous is because he put out that um, graphic that showed all of the different um, ad ad adoption. Uh, the ladder, uh, the light, the ladder yeah. diagram. Exactly, uh, showing mo it would be mostly an industrial. Eight. Thing. Well, so we're at the top of the hour, so I'm actually going to wrap this up. I really appreciate the presentation, Dr. Gray. Thank you so much, as well as the discussion afterwards and the great questions. Um, you know, as always, Sorry, I might if, I, if I may say, oh, Aaron, thank you for thank you for the opportunity. I really enjoyed myself. The, the the you know the level and the breadth of the discussion are really really stimulating. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. Um, and we appreciate again you getting up at the crack of dawn there uh, to speak with us halfway across the globe. Um, the sun is up. <laughs> okay. Uh, great. Well, let me just add end with um, a final call for any announcements for the good of the group as we do. Um, is there anything more that anyone wants to share uh, news or opportunities related to hydrogen in Alaska? Okay. Thank you. We will get all of this stuff up on the website. Patty has been wonderful in shepherding all these materials. We are taking a break for July and August because that is summertime in Alaska, and I hope everyone has a chance to get out and enjoy it uh, in whatever form or fashion that you like to do. Um, I hope, however, that people will remain in communication and uh, that projects continue to move forward, and we'll have lots to talk about uh, when we come back together in September. So, We'll be keeping you updated and I thank you all for your time and attention and participation today. Have a wonderful summer.